Good morning and welcome to all of you who have joined us here this morning to study God's Word. hope that you're all doing well and I hope that you're observing the rules for the COVID-19 virus. Please wear your mask when you go out and observe the social distancing that you're asking for because this virus seems to be getting worse rather than better. So let's do our part in trying to keep it down and um, help it to end. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne to ask for forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for the many blessings you provide for us. Father, there are those who are suffering spiritual, physical, and personal concern that we don't know about because of the uncertain times and the COVID-19. Father, we ask you to wrap them in your love and let them feel your healing power as it comforts them. And we ask that your will in their lives be done. Thank you, Father, for those who have come to the study of this lesson. We ask you to open our hearts and give us a vision of our future hope. We thank you for the assurance we have in that hope. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we ask and pray. Amen. Our lesson today is on the culmination of our hope. The point of the lesson is what we hope for in Christ will one day be fully attained. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5b through 11. C.S. Lewis lived through two world wars and understood all too well the griefs of that season. Many were suffering greatly across his homeland of Great Britain. Additionally, Lewis mourned the death of his wife, Joy, who passed away after an illness during their brief marriage. Yet the suffering and the setbacks that dotted Lewis's life only seemed to fuel his writings. In one of his greatest accomplishments, near Christianity, for example, Lewis wrote, If I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death, because Christians have been given eternal life in the coming kingdom of God. We have hope. The trials of this life will one day give way to a life of eternal joy and peace. Our first scripture of today, 1 Peter 5, verses 5b through 7. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. When we think about standing strong against any kind of opposition, most of us would seek to be bold and courageous. Peter encourages us to respond to our trial with humility. Peter employed a most unique word which we translate into English as clothes. It's the only time we see this particular word in the New Testament, and it describes the apron worn by slaves. Slaves wore this apron over their outer garment, and it distinguishes them from those who were free. Peter was commissioning believers to take up humility, like the garment of the slave, and act with humility towards one another. Peter surely must have had that in mind the moment Jesus tied the slave's apron around his waist, 
took a water basin and washed his disciples' feet. Jesus is a perfect embodiment of humility. Not only did he display this trait, he calls us to do the same. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. The apostle also likely recalled his own stunned reaction when Jesus clothed himself and did the work of the lowest servant. To conclude the washing of his disciples' feet, Jesus instructed them, Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set the example that you should do as I have done for you. Humble yourself. Rather than putting the focus on you making an effort to humble yourself, make the effort to allow God to humble you. Peter is pointing to the suffering we are facing. Peter encourages us to allow God to use our suffering to deepen our commitment to live in humility before him. Peter learned to follow this example and now he's calling for us to do the same. Clothe yourselves with humility. Humility creates an atmosphere of intimacy with God. No human can strut before the Savior. Humility is directly related to our submission to God and His authority. As we submit under His mighty hand, we recognize His control over our lives, His grace in our suffering, and the sacrifice of His only Son to give us living hope. Jesus assures us that though we have suffering in this world, He will enable us to have peace. Our suffering will end when he returned to take us to be with him in heaven forever. Peter urges us to cast all of our cares on God to demonstrate our humility and confidence we have in God's plans for our lives. One clear way to demonstrate humility was to give God all of our worries and fears and to trust that his grace is enough to enable us to endure our circumstances. Yes, God in his sovereignty allows bad things to happen. But God's primary motivation was and is always his love. He wants us to become more holy, more loving, more obedient to Christ, and to experience his kind of joy. We can be certain about God's love for us. Even as we humble ourselves before God, we should also be ready and watchful. We should not grow lax or underestimate the fierceness of the enemy. Peter described the devil with a vivid image of one who is strong, loud, and relentless. Certainly these verses weren't intended to scare us but to wake us up. The battle is raging. The enemy is real. The days are evil. And the time is short. We can't afford to take a nap while Satan is on the prowl. The devil's message are simple. Attack us and tempt us. He tempts us to replace our commitment to do God's will with satisfying our human evil desires. He tries to use this message to keep us from faithful obedience. Paul challenges us to stand firm in the knowledge of our sure salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ, relying on him by whose power we are being guarded and who has given us living hope. The devil is strong, but our faith is a foundation for our resistance. We don't resist through sheer determination or effort. 
We resist the devil in the firm assurance of our belief that he is a defeated foe and we serve a conquering king. It's interesting that Peter brought attention to the similar suffering of believers around the world even as he sought to bolster the resolve of his readers. How could they resist the devil and stand firm? They could fight in the understanding that they're not alone and that fellow believers were experiencing and resisting the same temptations and suffering. The same is true for us today. When faced with persecution or trial or difficult day, we need to be reminded that we're not alone. Other members of the body of Christ are experiencing even more suffering around the world. Every month, on average, 345 Christians are killed for faith-related reasons. 105 churches and Christian buildings are burned or attacked. 219 Christians are detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. As we become aware of the persecuted church around the world, let's turn that knowledge into prayer. Let's pray for the persecuted church and the people, Christian people, around the world. Next scripture, we have verses 10 and 11. And the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power and glory forever. Amen. Peter identified God as the God of all grace. Grace is a characteristic of God and the priceless gift with which he shares with those who respond to his call to repent and faith in Christ. Grace is a means of both our entering into a personal relationship with God and our being held eternally secure in that relationship. Peter magnified the brilliance of God from whom every single grace is given. The things that we've been given, the hope, calling, provision, strength, restoration, joy, endurance, and reward, all flow from God's grace. Look at the actions of God that Peter stacks like building block upon the firm foundation of hope in Christ. Restore. God is able to perfect us and mend anything that may need repair. This conveys the idea of mending a net or restoring a bone to its proper place when it's out of joint. God himself will set us right so that nothing is lacking as he shapes us into the image of his Son. Make you firm? This means to ground someone, and it carries the idea of having a firm footing. Once he has restored us, God gives us a firm foundation under our feet as we live out our salvation in a manner worthy of the gospel. Make you strong. Peter's use of this phrase is pretty self-explanatory as it comes from a root word meaning strength. It is reminiscent of God's promise to the nation of Israel. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In our weakness, God exhibits his strength through us. Make you steadfast. God has laid the foundation of our lives with Jesus Christ himself as our cornerstone. Jesus used the same word when he described the wise man building his house on solid rock foundation, thus enabling it to 
withstand the rain, rising water, and winds. Love the stunning beauty with which Peter closed this rudder as he ushered us to the bigger picture. May we have suffered a little while, but it's as if he had gently placed his hand under our chin and lifted our gaze from temporary to eternal. We've been called to eternal glory in Christ. For a little while, these four words shine like bright beams of light in any darkness and difficulty. With a view to eternity, any suffering we experience is short and has an end. It will not last forever, and it will not overshadow the whole of our lives with Christ. What will you do to maintain eternal perspective regarding the blessed hope that is yours in Christ? Think about this lesson, or the six lessons that we've just studied, and what it has taught you about hope. Be sure you have an understanding of hope and its impact upon you. Use 1 Peter 5, 5b through 11 as a guide for praying. As you pray, surrender to the Lord and His eternal purposes for your life. Pray together for the persecuted church and Christians around the world. We may not see the kind of tragedy and pain that C.S. Lewis experienced in his life, but different types of suffering will certainly come. Though waves of suffering may sweep over us, God is our rock and our deliverer. He gives us strength to do his will and to stand firm. Just like the angels ministered to our Lord Jesus Christ after he experienced the temptation of the devil, we can be sure the Lord will support us through our time of suffering. So let's keep our eyes focused on the future hope and we'll glorify God in the here and now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this six lessons we have studied on living with hope in a broken world. We give you thanks, Father, for the assurance that our hope will someday be complete. Help us and those believers around the world who are being persecuted to endure through their suffering. As we go out in the coming days, keep us in your care till once again we can join together here to study your word. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we ask and pray. Amen.